Our next speaker is John Fitzpatrick with the Network Denver firm Wheeler, Trigg & O'Donnell. If you haven't heard Fitz speak before, you're in for a treat. He's a former Airborne Ranger and concert pianist. He's every client's wish, wish for a fearless trial lawyer. His experience ranges from high stakes mass tort litigation where he's National Trial Counsel for GE, Foster Wheeler, Spence and Veland Valve in asbestos, National Trial Counsel for GE in pharmaceutical litigation, and a member of various national trial SWAT teams for high exposure and med mal cases for CNA, Swiss Ray, UHS, AT&T, Premier, and Medical Protective. In the past five years, he's tried 31 cases to verdict in 17 states, prevailing in two of them. Oh, is it? Oh, is it? oh sorry, it's 28. His partner, Hugh, put me up to that. Thir <laughs> 31 cases in 17 states, prevailing in 28 of them. Pretty impressive. In total, Fitz has tried over 200 cases to verdict in 32 states in his career. When your local counsel is begging you to settle and pay millions, this is the guy to call, John Fitzpatrick. Okay, after watching what Eddie had, I felt like SEAL Team 6 is coming, although when he was talking about, uh, when you were saying something about Twitter, I bet old Wiener doesn't want to be on Twitter, does he? <laughs> and what was that? I, I love the New York Post. Have you ever seen the New York Post? You'll love those headlines when, you know, Pelosi calls for a probe of Wiener. <laughs> I mean, it just got better. You could make something out of the Post. Anyway, uh, good to be here. Uh, as usual, it's wait till next year for the Cubs. Sometimes we say that in August, but we've said it here in April. So June's no change. Um, good to be here. Good to see all you here. Free sale is always good. Uh, what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about selecting counsel. All right. Generally, what are we going to find when we have corporate counsel? Risk averse. I mean, they're going to tell you. Have you been to some of those cases? You see, they will do anything they can to avoid going trial. It's time, it's money, it's potentially bad PR. The general counsel's first comment is, can you make this go away? Just approach the plaintiff lawyers and get a good settlement. Okay, that's really music to the ears. And you see that OMG, my kids taught me that. I, I didn't know what the heck that meant. And he says, Dad, that's like, oh my God, it's a you know, quick way to do it. I said, oh. So I thought I'd show you that I'm really into the new age here. But, what does the general counsel say? Hire a big firm. A big firm who generally has no trial experience. They send legions of associates. They beg to do focus groups. The great focus group. We're gonna find out what a jury's gonna do in two hours. You've gotta be kidding me. And then after that, they say, ah, recommend settlement. And of course, the general counsel says, I got the biggest firm. How can I be second guessed? What's plaintiff's mantra? I mean, whether it's, you can think of any scenario, profits over safety, corporate greed, Bottom line only, send them a message. How many times do we have to hear that? And then invariably, if you've got, say, a products company, your marketing division says what? Sell, sell, sell. Sell them all. It doesn't matter. Cut them off. The science department will say, oh, we've got to rush to new drugs. We've got to get this out. So now we're rushing. And then, of course, pharmacovigilance says, what do we do with the FDA? You will always have conflicting documents. You're never going to have a clean case, a med mal case. You will always have... Documents missing. They miss. I don't know how that happens. Always in my case. We're missing documents. So what? Dangerous jurisdictions. For those of you who haven't been to West Virginia, it's a treat. Texas. Texas tort reform has gotten better. Oakland, California. Ooh, that's one. Philly State Court. Madison County, Illinois. They sue doctors sometimes. They'll try to drive a wedge between the corporation. Get them working at each other. And then the final thing is, when you don't have a good case on the plaintiff's side, what do you do? You create one. How do you create one? Discovery wars. Start production, then ask for punes, then ask for sanctions because you didn't produce this. Or some guy who's been fired said, oh, I left documents there. Where are they? And it becomes nothing more than a discovery dispute. So your general counsel says, settle quickly. And honestly, folks, when you do that, if you look so enthusiastic to settle, what does a plaintiff lawyer say, generally? They want to pay me a lot of money now, wait till we get to the trial door. They'll pay me a hell of a lot more. So if your defense lawyer has no trial experience, trust me, the plaintiff lawyer will find it. Until you have someone who says, I'm willing to go to trial, you'll pay a lot of money. Red flags. 
any of the adjusters out here, anybody in corporations know class actions, that needs to get your attention. Drugs, medical devices, asbestos. My God, the gift that keeps on giving. 40 years, when will that sun set? I don't think in my lifetime. The newest one, traumatic brain injury. I've never seen people bump on something and have a traumatic brain injury. They get it. Uh, the permanent vegetative stay, finger pointing, brain damage baby, paralysis. Come to New York City, I, I'm starting a trial Monday in New York City. Uh, big name plaintiff lawyers, this should all get your attention because trust me, they are out to get a lot of money. When you hire the big firms, now I'll say I probably couldn't get admitted in most of these firms, they're great firms. But their partners average maybe one case to verdict every eight to 37 years, that's good. So, what I asked adjusters, and here's what I would ask you to do, and you need to do this, general counsels or whatever, ask the question. When you go meet the big, the big senior lawyer, how many cases to verdict have you tried? And you know what, when they say, well, and they look up to the sky, that's not a good sign. Well, we're all trial lawyers by training. I've tried a lot of cases, but most settle. I mean, I was ready to go to verdict. The client was happy, got me to shut it down, and I saved a lot of money. Honestly, lawyers can spin anything. We will always save you money. If it covers our butt, that's what we love to say. If that's the answer, that's the wrong answer. How about the second question? When he says, you know, after all, trying a case is like riding a bike. Really? Would you take your loved one to a cardiac surgeon, say you need a heart surgery, and wouldn't you ask, would you ask the surgeon, how many open heart surgeries do you do like in the last five years? What are your complications? And the response is, well, I've been in there. I've done a few, I've read the books, and you know, the heart looks the same. Oh, that gives me a lot of comfort. Or do you want someone who says, I do this about 200 times a year. I open up, I cut. I'll tell you what my complication rates is. All right. Third, ask to speak to their clients. I mean, I, I know I got a lot of good friends here from CNA. They'll, they'll, they tell me stories all the time. The great question, I got Peter Van Dyke Van there. Ask him, do, hit, do lawyers have a history of bailing out? What's the early report that you all see? The case is defensible. We're going to win, win, win. Oh, we got it. 80, 90% I'll win. And then as the trial gets close, what do they say? It's 50-50. Oh my God, is that the biggest? How can I lose? 50 win, 50 lose, oh, you never know. <laughs> Just as we're getting close. And you say, what caused it to be 50-50? Well, you know, things develop. After I build the living bejesus out of you. And then the week before trial, your trial lawyer says, we're going down. We gotta settle. If, if you don't settle, we're gonna make the papers. There'll be punitive damages. And then you pay 10 million and what does your lawyer say? Oh, I saved you 20. You know, I've been hit for 20 or 30 in the papers. Paying 10, I saved you a lot of money. Are you kidding me? That case goes from we're gonna win, win, win to you pay 10. It's your money. All right, fourth, you say, how am I gonna do on trial? What do the lawyers say? Oh, there's sympathy. Well, no kidding, Sherlock. We just killed someone, brain damage. I mean, what do you expect? Do you think people like corporations? No. There's always going to be sympathy. All cases are sympathy. But a good lawyer has to be able to tell a story. You heard that from Mooney. Those are wonderful stories. That's what gets the jury's attention. Ask them. After they've billed you for I don't know how long, you ought to call them in and just, you want to shock them? Just say, give me an opening. Oh, you watch the sweat start to come down. Just say, give me 10 minutes. What, what are you going to tell a jury? Talk to me. What are you going to say? Well, I got to get my associates in. I don't have it done. I'm not ready. But in three years, just ask me that question. If they can't do that, if they can't tell a story, you got the wrong lawyer. And then ask them, how many have you tried and won? I mean, ask them. It's okay. The lawyer says, well, I really don't keep statistics. Give me a break. You keep statistics. And not that you can't have good settlements. Not that there aren't cases. There, I mean, a number of us get called in. We're worried just about punitive damages. We got admitted liability. Generally, we don't win those. But if we can keep punes down, we can. But ask them, how many of you won? I don't care. Tell me how many you go to verdict and you say, hit me. Do I win? Find that out. You should know that. Don't underestimate the intelligence of a jury. Don't ignore the medicine. 
don't conduct social experiments with company assets because of race or gender. Juries don't like being pandered to. Nothing beats trial experience, pure and simple. Okay, quick couple of things. I got hired in a case a while back for AT&T. Two-year-old woman comes in the store, unsupervised like you wouldn't believe, going under a plastic sign, she falls. I was talking about this in October, and then we tried the case in uh, December. Uh, the jury was out about six minutes, and I'll show you why. They pushed it, collapsed against the window. Seconds later, mom picks him up. Seems to have no ill effects. Uh, the next day, oh, this is the famous sign. We call, I call this an opening, the killer sign. It just jumped out at him. And next day, he suffered seizures, diagnosed with post-traumatic epilepsy, and he was diagnosed with that famous traumatic brain syndrome. So for AT&T, did we have to supervise? And they say, you can't blame mom. What do you mean I can't blame mom? Wait till you see part of this video. Was the sign dangerous, that plastic sign? Was it an attractive nuisance? Did we have to supervise a child? Does AT&T become a romper room? Are we taking care of kids? I don't think so. So they hired a neurologist. I can tell you stories about him. He said a moderate to severe traumatic brain injury complicated, or complicated by epilepsy. Permanent disability, the kid's never gonna do anything. That's what they had at mediation two months before trial. They wanted 20 million non-negotiable. Our experts didn't help, and the local says it'll take five million to settle. Uh, the pucker factor was a little tight. So the video surveillance. They asked me, would you look at this case? I said, well, what do you have? We got surveillance. I said, you gotta be kidding me. You got a video? Has anybody seen it? Well, it's really hard to see. And it was that video that was in like nine different boxes. Now, if you look at nine boxes, you see, there's two of them if you put together just might help. Let's see. So here's the video. Here's the kid, you see the kid over there and you're gonna see him walk under that killer sign. Now, if you watch it, You'll see the sign. They were looking at these. They said, we can't see because it's obscure. He'll go through this three times. But if you watch on the right, you'll see that head never hits. He does this turnaround. He literally puts his hand down to break his fall. He never hit. What the heck did he have an injury on? Okay, here we go. Now, of course, mom's nowhere to be seen. Imagine that. Kid's playing through. Sign you think's out of the way. Here he comes. Now he's going to push up against it and then watch that's too big for him. Come on, come on, little kid, push that damn thing. Okay, here we go. Now watch on the right. You can see the little head, and that, he drops up, and watch. Boom, you see the hand turn? This is what they wanted, 20 million. And I got locals saying we're dead, and I got an expert saying you're dead. Oh, okay. Now watch this. Mom's really concerned. Hello, Jenny. How you doing? Pick him up. Sorry. Everything's fine. I had a picture of her walking out with a big smile. Three, she's a lawyer. Three days later, she came back to get a picture of the sign. She's looking at this. Here's my brain damage kid. Because she wanted pictures of the evidence. I mean, this is not rocket science. This was the case for $20 million. at and was worried about trying it. What do we do? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, we got a couple experts. If you ever use Exponent, they're tremendous. I got he was head of child neurology. I tried to rehabilitate my experts by saying, did you look at the video? No, local didn't send me the video. It's hard to figure out. You're kidding me. You didn't look at this? And so off we went. So one of the things in anything, attack plaintiff experts. Read their publications, attack bias, attack credentials. This was the guy. He testified for 40 years, 80 to 90% for the plaintiffs, 40 states, reviews one to three cases a month, charges what you can see. I'm able to say, he says, you know, I don't know how much I make. You don't? I mean, just doing the math, you can see. Here's what I did. I love this question. How much do you make? I don't know. You don't know? Do you tell the IRS? I don't know. Do you apply for a loan? How much do you make? I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, juries have a field day with it. I tell the jury in closing, wouldn't we all like to tell the IRS? I don't know. I'm not sure. A little bit, a little more, I don't know. So I just did the math. I said, I want to be reasonable, which I never want to be reasonable. How much? Uh, he did 30 hours a month. He did. He says, okay, 144K. I got 24 depths at a $1,500 flat fee. I said, he said, you know, three to six. I had him probably eight to 10. I did the math. I said, this is good money. You do well. And what are your credentials? You find out when you research. He had testified before the court of claims. He loves all those vaccine injuries. Even the court of claims said he pays fast and loose with the facts. Oh, and he said, those government lawyers just didn't like me. He slants his testimony, uses unreliable data. He's able to get all this in under, quote, bias. He, says, he said they reversed this. They now allow me to testify. 
I said, did you bring anything? He hadn't published anything since 1980, and I held up, except this book, Doc. It's called a book on shotguns. Shotguns? That's good. I said, these are wonderful guns, 1600, 1700 century. The, these are personal, aren't they? You have a good collection. You make a lot of money. Well, I, I don't know if they're all mine. I said, well, here, look, tell me which ones aren't. I don't care. Not on the staff. He hasn't admitted patient in 15 years, but boy, he's good. This guy did a birth trauma case. Again, look at the credentials. I saw he had two chapters. I went and bought the chapters. One, the textbook didn't exist. There's no textbook. And the chapter, his name's not listed. He said, well, I published it, but they didn't put my name on it. I said, how about the textbook? And you could tell he was sweating bullets. He said, uh, they didn't accept it. I said, you mean you lied? Well, I didn't lie. Well, what would you like to call it? Well, I just forgot to take it off. Really? He hadn't been in court in 20 years, and he was charging 40 grand for the case. I said, boy, you're making up for lost time. That's good. And then, again, when you read prior transcripts, here I am in D.C. You want to talk about an urban jury? You betcha. And this is what the idiot says when they ask him a question one time in another depth. I work in Provo, Utah. You know, a lot of Mormons there. We don't have a lot of those drugs, alcohol, and bad habits like people in urban cities. Thus, when I treat premature infants, I treat pure prematurity. I mean, I, I'm looking at this thinking, this is gold. You couldn't make this up. I read it to him. I said, is this you? And I'm looking at the jury. They want to kill him. He says, I think you're taking that out of context. I said, well, which context do you want it in? All right. You talk about telling a story. This was the case. I said, you, you talk about showing a picture of the jury. They were trying to say whether something caused brain damage. I said, okay, there's the plaintiff experts against basically the entire world. And I went through that. That's an effective picture. Ah, this is what I love when they write books. Experts say the dumbest things. This guy <laughs> writes a book on expert testimony. You got to buy it. Credibility is your most important asset. If they find out your background later is false, oh my God, that would be bad. What else does he say? <laughs> don't embellish, don't exaggerate. You might be an advocate. Oh, I love it. What else do you say? Tell the truth. Yo, <laughs> let's go to the truth. You took 10 years to graduate under college. It's good, you keep trying. You flunked out of five schools. Try to get your master's three times and then you lied because you flunked out. You got your PhD from a diploma mill. You failed the certified industrial hygiene exam seven times. You claim you're in the Navy, but you're never aboard a ship. You work for the plaintiffs while you're working at Cal OSHA and you still misrepresent. Oh, look what you find out. Here's my application to the diploma mill. Degree received, master's. Huh, really? <laughs> then is an own resume. I worked toward a bachelor's degree. It's saying it completed. I worked leading toward a master's degree, he says, completed. That's what the SOB says. Really? And we go to that famous PhD mill, Cal Western, generally you need a master's before you get it, so he claimed he had a master's. And of course, the US government says diploma mills are bogus degrees, that's where my boy went. And of course, here's what he claims. Microbiology, chemistry, master's, and a famous diploma mill. Well, how do I know? Again, he says, full-time completed. Uh, that's wrong. Why is that wrong? Because, oh my God, he withdrew after one semester in the master's. Huh. Really? As I call this the Avis, at first you don't succeed, you try eight times. That's good. I says, I'm glad you got through eight times, Ken. That's good. Then his biographical data, he says, yeah, I've got that master's degree. Well, what happened? Huh. Yo, there's been an allegation that uh, maybe you got a master's degree that maybe is not there. Can you help us resolve this question? And now look at that stupid letterhead. What an idiot. I have no idea what that is. Some naked guy? You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> and what does he say? You know, I was trying to write my thesis and you know, I, don't, I don't claim a master's degree, although I completed the requirements and blah, blah, blah. You gotta be kidding me. You know, I love when people whine. So they say, okay, so you didn't do it. He says, you know, I didn't. By the way, if you've you know, you're retired, you can't call yourself CIH. They write a letter to <laughs> says, you know, we got a letter that you got this letterhead claiming you're a certified industrial, you can't be, you can't do this, don't put that. <laughs> he says, oh, no problem, I'll remove it. I, I understand, I'm not trying to say what I'm not. And then of course, the next trial I had with him, <laughs> where'd that come from? And then I love, you know, again, sometimes you just put this up, sort of like Mooney said, you just put this up. 
Look at what he claims he's an expert in. Drugs, ergonomics, homicide, homicide chemicals, medical, medical. He's the man for all seasons. And yet he still testifies. He makes close to a million dollars in plaintiff's asbestos, and nobody does this. It's damn, it's just obscene. So, in a nutshell, don't be afraid to make a change. Choose someone with national scope, someone who tries to win cases, someone who can tell a story. Choose a lawyer who actually knows what a courtroom looks like. It's your money. I'd spend it wisely. And I thank you for your time.